Um, I'm Jamie Gustafson, and this is the audience target and messaging um, breakout session. So if you were looking for lobbying or legal help, you are in the wrong place. Um, but really excited to be working with you guys. Um, I'm from Spitfire Strategies, and we are a communications firm that's um, entirely focused on nonprofit and foundation work. Um, and have been really fortunate to be working with Choose Clean Water for about the past six months, um, working on the TMDL issue and talking about how to really make a really complex, kind of confusing issue resonate with audiences and get them on board. Um, so we're excited to bring some of that information to you guys and then to really uh, take some time and talk about how, how you choose your audiences how you um, choose messaging based on those audiences and how you can really connect with your audiences no matter what the specific issue you're working on is. So a uh, quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about uh, targeting your audience, uh, tell you a little bit about the research that we did on the TMDL issue uh, just as a way of really explaining how you can use that audience targeting research um, to create compelling messages. Um, go through crafting a message, then we'll review some of the uh, messages that we created on behalf of Choose Clean Water. Uh, and then the bulk of the afternoon will really, or the bulk of the time we have together, will really spend on an activity where you can create messages that resonate for the campaigns and the, the work that you are looking at right now. So we want you to not just sort of sit here and listen to me talk, but to actually walk out with something that will hopefully be useful to you and your organization. Uh, so when we're talking about messaging, the most important thing to do and the, the most important place to start is to figure out who your audience is. Because if you want your messages to really resonate with your audience, you want to A, know who that audience is, but B, segment them down as much as possible. So before we even start writing messages, it's really important to be clear about what is your goal? What are you hoping to achieve? You know, what do you want to do what is your, A, your big overarching goal, but B, your more specific objective, and who do you need to reach to actually achieve that goal? Um, when we're talking about who you need to reach, you want to think about two things. The first is, who are the decision makers? Who are the people who have the ultimate yes, no, you know, to help you either achieve or to stop you from achieving your goals? Um, but then once you look at those decision makers, sometimes they are sort of way up here and you don't have direct access to them. So you want to look at who those audiences are around them that might help you better communicate with your decision makers. Um, when we talk about audiences, the more you can segment them down, the better off you are and the more effectively you're going to be able to message to them. Uh, at Spitfire, one of our big rules is that the general public is never an audience. If you're talking to everybody, you're really communicating with nobody. Um, and a good way to think about this is, you know, if I asked any one of you in this room, you know, tell me about yourself, I guarantee nobody would stand up and say, part of the general public. You know, you might <laughs> say, I'm a woman, I'm college educated, I live in DC, you know, I care about XYZ, I'm a mother. You know, nobody's going to stand up and say, I'm Joe Q. Public. So something to really think about because especially when we talk about values-based messaging, it's really important to break down who those audiences are and what their specific values are before you can really start messaging to them effectively. Um, so once you've figured out who your audience is, it, audience is and you've really narrowed it down, you want to think about what is important to them. And this is a part that sometimes gets hard. A lot of times you think, this is what I wish my audience would care about. You know, I want them to do it because it's the right thing to do. I want them to do it, you know, to save the birds. I want them to do it because I think clean water is important. But at the end of the day, you really need to figure out what's important to them and message to that. Uh, so a story we like to tell called the frog story um, is a good indication of sort of how this works. So a few years ago, a group came to Spitfire and said, you know what, there's this airport expansion that has been proposed, and if they expand the airport, it is going to kill this, um, you know, it's going to wipe out this species of frogs um, that's in the path of the expansion. We need you to stop this. We said, OK. 
okay, so this is something we can something we can work with. So we did a bunch of research. We talked to people in the area, talked to neighbors, and said, you know, what do you think about this expansion? People said, oh, it, it's going to create so much traffic in my area. It's going to, you know, cause delays. It's going to make my commute so much worse. So we went back to the organization and said, great, figure out a way to save your frogs. You know, people are really concerned about all of the new traffic that this airport expansion is going to cause. So if we talk about this, you know, we can get folks on board for stopping this airport expansion. And the group looked at us and said, no, we want to save the frogs. You know, we want to talk about the frogs and, and get people on board to stop the airport expansion for the frogs. So at the end of the day, that's a disconnect. You know, this group cared very deeply about the frogs, but we could get the same thing accomplished, but we needed to talk about the traffic because at the end of the day, there's not enough people who care about the frogs to really you know, get this job done. So um, it's a good example of why you really need to concentrate on your audience's values rather than you know, what you hope they'd care about, what you wish they'd care about. Um, you're going to be a lot more effective. And you know maybe with a ton of money and a lot of time, we could have gotten people on board for those frogs. But sometimes you want people to do what you're asking them to do you don't necessarily need them to do it for your reasons. So something to keep in mind when we're messaging. So when you're talking about your audience, you also really want to concentrate on what are their barriers? What are the reasons that they're not doing the things that you're asking them to do? Um, these barriers can be big, you know, big things out there. Sometimes they're really small. You know, sometimes they're things like, hey, you want me to, you know, come to another meeting, but I'm already overbooked. You know, that's not a huge philosophical objection to what you're trying to do. That's a, hey, I, you know, I, I just can't put another thing on my plate. Um, so when we're talking about barriers, there's usually a couple different ways to get people over their barriers. Uh, sometimes they just don't have the information. You just need to give them a little bit more information. You know, if you're asking them to reach out to their member of Congress, sometimes it's just don't really know how to do that you know sometimes it's something as simple as let me give you you know a form letter let me give you a click through on my website so that you can know exactly who you're trying to reach out to and who the proper person in their office is uh, sometimes they're just it's outside their comfort zone it's something you know I might be willing to sign on to a petition I might not be willing to stand up at a meeting you know in front of my peers and say something so in that case, you know, you might want to find something within their comfort zone to help them really figure out, you know, I can do this, I can be comfortable, I can take this first step. Um, and the third thing is that sometimes, I completely lost my train of thought, I apologize. Um, sometimes they just, um, the risk for them is not as big as the reward. So sometimes they might be really on board with what you want them to do. But for them, they, th they think it's a risk. You know, it's either they're uncomfortable doing it. It might be, you know, when you're talking about a policymaker, um, you know, you just you need to show them that, that the reward is going to be bigger than the risk. And that doesn't always mean that it's a tangible thing. Sometimes it's people re will remember you as a champion of clean water. You know, sometimes it's just a stroke of the ego and that's enough. But you really need to figure out what that barrier is so you can figure out how you can get them over that hump. So when we were talking about the TMDL issue, and I shouldn't assume, I know we're in a room of people who uh, work, with, or work with clean water issues every day, but are you all familiar with the total maximum daily load? Awesome, figured you were. <laughs> um, so, and we were working with Choose Clean Water to figure out how they could message in the Chesapeake watershed states to talk about TMDL in a way that would resonate uh, both with policymakers but also with um, some of those key audiences and some of those people within member organizations who would be sort of push, putting pressure on policymakers. So did a variety of different kinds of research. We probably talked to some of the folks in this room because we did a bunch of stakeholder interviews with people related to the issue um, in all of the states. Um, people who were on the policymaker side, folks who were on the nonprofit side, folks who were advocates, um, you know, just sort of the full gamut of folks. 
Um, we did two media scans. The first was before the EPA released their TMDL um, with plans, and then a second round afterwards just to see if people had sort of changed the way they were talking about the TMDL issue um, and if the resistance had sort of changed course, if it was on the same same ground, if people were starting to say, hey, wait a minute, I didn't, e didn't even know I was objected to X, Y, and Z. Fortunately, we found out that wasn't the case. You know, people dug in their heels, but they didn't really change their objections. Um, and then we looked through a ton of different materials, both things created uh, by Choose Clean Water, but also just by uh, various coalition partners talking about the issue to really figure out how people were talking about uh, this very complex issue in a way that made sense um, to people who might not be living and breathing the issue. Um, so some of these things, most of these things are probably pretty obvious to you guys because um, you live in this world. But one of the things that, that we found that people cared about was that clean water creates jobs, it attracts businesses, and it increases property values. So, and sort of the gist of that is clean water doesn't just matter for the environment. You know, clean water has uh, serious economic benefits and that's something, it's probably not news to anybody who's, you know, been out there, but economic benefits are something that really resonate with folks right now. You know, being able to talk about why this is not just good for the environment, but why it's good for the bottom line is something that is always a winner, especially as um, the policymakers and the legislative environment moves to the right. Um, economic arguments hold a lot of weight. Um, another thing that we found over and over, especially from folks in the advocacy community, was that this is a really key moment in time. You know, we've been talking about this for 25 years. This is an issue that has been ongoing, but right now is the time to save the bay. You know, if we want to talk about pollution limits in the bay, if we don't do something now, we could cause irreparable damage. Um, and similar to the first point, that it's really, really important that we connect clean water and the health benefits to uh, pollution and tax dollars. You know, things that are really on folks' minds right now, it's really important that we talk about the way that, um, not only the way that it has economic benefits, but we really needed to make those connections between the, the tax revenue and the costs of uh, cleaning up now as opposed to the much larger cost of cleaning up down the line. Um, we found that each of the states within the watershed area had their own very unique issues. So talking about TMDL just in terms of protecting the bay was just a non-starter. Um, this is something that is not news to anybody who works in the Chesapeake um, issue or on Chesapeake related issues. But, you know, even in Maryland and Virginia, two states that are very closely tied and you know, geographically touching the bay, just talking about a clean bay was not going to get the job done. Um, and then post the EPA's um, Chesapeake Bay announcements, the messages on both sides didn't really change. It, we just found that folks had sort of dug in their heels on either side of the issue. So, you know, if people before we're talking about, you know, the EPA um, putting these limits is an overreach into state powers, you know, they just amped up the volume on that. So does anybody have questions about sort of the upfront and the work we did in terms of audience targeting for the TMDL issue or just audience targeting in general? Awesome. Well, then we will jump right into the message box tool. And um, the message box is a tool that Spitfire uses to create messaging. Um, it's not rocket science. It's not com something that's completely foreign to um, the way others do messaging. It's just something that we found is effective and um, is it a useful way to organize your thoughts. So a um, couple things I want to point out before we even jump into this. The reason that this is a message box and is set up sort of in this um, somewhat circular motion is because you're not always starting in the same place. So when we create messages, we always like to 
start at the top and work our way clockwise. But when you're actually using the messages, sometimes you start, you know, in different quadrants. Doesn't make a difference. Um, it's just a useful way to sort of organize your thoughts before you get started, and then you can go, you know, you can jump around within the box when you're actually using the messages. So up front, we start with the value, and this is the message that really gets your audience shaking their head and saying, "Okay, yeah, you know, I'm on board with that. I agree with you." Um, and then we move to the barrier. And so if the value message is where people are shaking their head and saying, mm -hmm, yeah, I'm on board, barriers where they say, yeah, but, and this is where you want to help them get over their objection. So the key thing to remember when we're creating barrier messages is that, A, you never want to repeat the barrier. Uh, you know, people are doing a million things when they're listening to your messages. If you repeat the barrier, half the time they just walk away remembering the barrier, not remembering how you got them over that. Um, so it's very important to not repeat your barrier, and this message should be the thing that helps them get past that, you know, helps them get around that objection. Every time you're doing messages, no matter what, you want to have an ask. You want to have one specific thing that you and the person you're talking to or the audience that you're talking to knows that you want them to do when they walk away from you. Um, it's important to be specific. One that we see a lot is support X, Y, and Z, but you and your audience might have a very different idea of what support means. So you might say, you know, support this, and you come back three weeks later and you say, you know, I really thought you were on board with me. I really thought that you had you know, we're committed to this issue without you're going to be active on it. And they'd say, yeah, I've been supporting you. You know, I've been sitting here the whole time being really supportive. <laughs> um, so you want to make sure that you and your audience knows exactly what you're hoping that they will do um, walking away from these messages. And then finally, your vision. And your vision is what the world will look like if you're the audience that you're talking to does what you ask them to do. So your vision should be very closely tied to the values up front. You don't want to start out with an economic um, argument or an economic value and then come around and have your vision be, and then the birds will have a clean place to live. You know, that doesn't connect to the value. So you want to make sure that your value and your vision are right in line. Uh, so we have an example just to uh, sort of talk through how the system works um, on the death penalty. So, and in this particular case, we were talking to an audience of Catholic policymakers, and the value that they, um, the value that we identified that they really cared about was fairness and justice. So, the value message is. Innocent people should not be wrongly convicted and sentenced to die. You know, everybody's pretty on board with that. Um, but the yeah, but might be, yeah, but does that really happen? Well, more than 100 have since 1970. So, you know, and that's where your audience says, hmm, maybe this is an issue, okay. Um, so the ask in this particular case was to pass DNA testing for all accused of a capital crime. So again, we're not asking them to abolish the death penalty. We're not asking them to take a huge leap. We're just asking for this one specific thing. We want DNA testing. Um, and then it wraps back to your vision, which is then we'll all have a fair justice system. And again, that ties into you know innocent people shouldn't, shouldn't die for crimes uh, that they didn't do. And then we'll have a fair justice system. So you know, it sort of wraps you right back up there. Um, so let's take a quick look at the messages that we created for Choose Clean Water. Um, and as you guys know, and as we've talked about, um, the economic argument was something that we found really resonated with audiences when we were talking um, about clean water in general, but in particular with the TMDL issue. Uh, so we started with clean water is important for the health and economic security of our communities. So, all right, kind of on board with that. Um, and so people might say, yeah, but what does that have to do with this issue? Well, enforcing clean, 
Enforcing water safety standards keeps our water clean and protects the communities and businesses that rely on local rivers and streams. So with that, we tried to do two things. The first is to localize the issue. You know, it's for all of those businesses and communities. It's not just for the sort of Chesapeake Bay adjacent. Um, and, you know, this is why TMDL is important because enforcing those um, protects the communities. Um, could, you, could you just, yeah. what's the barrier there? I mean, what, how would you, because that, that's the barrier box, right? That is, yes. So. Um, and the barrier that we were, we were working against was that people were not making the connection. Um, okay. Yeah, making yeah. the connection between TMDL and these eco broader economic arguments. Um, and then our ask, and this was the audience I sh should have started with, or harp on audience, audience, audience. Um, the audience for this was members of organizations that are related to clean water. So um, both Choose Clean Water members, but also their sort of partner organizations or their, their sister organizations members as well. So our ask, um, and this was not the most specific ask, and we um, acknowledge that, but ask your state policymaker to support a clean water plan that complies with strict water safety standards. Basically, ask your policymaker to create a whip that actually has some teeth to it and actually does something. Um, and then that brings us around to our vision, which is our community will have access to the safe, clean water necessary to sustain our livelihoods and econo economies for generations to come. So sort of taking that value, but broadening it out a little bit, you know, it's not just for our economics today, it's for generations to come. So, yep. Yeah. So just a comparison of these words, which are so many words and so many goals and things, mm -hmm. to the, the justice of the death penalty one, that was just so clean. Yes. And did you wrestle with getting this cleaner? Or we, are you just trying to give a quick illustration right now? We did. Well, and that that's one of the challenges, and I think one of the things that this illustrates is in, um, in these messages, we were talking about very sort of broad concepts, whereas if you're talk the more specific, A, the more specific your goal, and B, the more specific your audience, the sort of cleaner and the more efficient your messaging becomes. Um, so that's, that is, in a case like this, you know, you are talking very broadly, and then underneath you would have some more specific points. Um, but I think it's something that's always helpful to remember is sort of the more specific you can be throughout the process, the better and the um, more targeted and cleaner your messages are going to be. Yep. Certainly. So when you're, when you're developing something like this, you really are looking first at who you're talking to, the ask part. So because otherwise you could develop a message that doesn't really... Exactly, that doesn't resonate and that doesn't get you where you need to be. So yeah, and that's why it's really important to start off by deciding who's your audience and what it is that you want them to do, um, and then you can look at what their you know then you look at what their value is and sort of build your messaging from there. So um, t just before we jump into um, some breakout and um, th give you guys a chance to sort of use this tool yourself, I wanted to talk about a couple of sins of messaging. Um, the first, and this is the only acronym we will use today, um, because acronyms are kind of a killer. You know, anytime there's jargon or acronyms or words that your audience is sort of nodding and are like, I've heard that word before, not entirely sure what they're talking about. Um, you've already lost them. But MIGO, which is my eyes glaze over. <laughs> and that... <laughs> is when you're just using so many words to say things that could be said more simply. A um, couple that we love to talk about, uh, charismatic megafauna. Anybody know what that is? <laughs> Cute animals. Um, so, you know, whenever you can use less jargony, less acronym filled, um, more accessible language, the better off you are. I think sometimes, especially when we're talking about complex issues, there's sort of a, a desire to be, you know, to show how smart we are. But I think when you're messaging, people assume you're smart, people understand that we know these issues, 
talk in language that people understand, it's going to be more effective. Um, second is too much information. Uh, one thing, especially we find in the nonprofit world, but I'm sure it happens other places, is that we live in a land of caveats. Well, this is true, except in some cases where it's not quite true, and especially when you're working with, you know, you've got scientists on your side, and they say things like, well, yeah, you can say that, but it's not entirely, you know, it's not accurate in 1% of the... Get rid of the caveats when you can. We're not asking you to be untruthful. We're not asking you to say things that are exaggerations, but try to reduce the number of caveats. I know the science side of, of the work we do makes them crazy. Um, great example is back when the Deepwater Horizon um, oil spill happened, we were working with an ocean group. And um, you guys might remember about six weeks later they found you know, some oil sludge on the bottom of the ocean. Um, all indications were that that had, you know, that was a secondary leak from the Deepwater Horizon. But the scientists that we were working with said, I mean, yeah, it's coming out from where the crack in the Deepwater Horizon is, and you know, it makes sense that it would be from that, but, you know, I mean, we should really wait until we can do the, you know, the testing to look at the microbial levels and, you know, before we, we say that it looks like there's another leak. Well, okay, but, you know, everyone else is already out there saying, hey, there's another leak in the deep water horizon. So, you, A, you miss those opportunities, but B, when you get that down in the weeds and that caveat filled, people start to think that you're not credible because, you know, if you have to put 14 caveats on it, then that probably, you know, do you even know what you're talking about? So when you can, try to avoid it. And as much as you can sort of push back on the science folks, um, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to be more effective. Um, the math problem. Statistical overload. A couple of statistics are great. You know, when you can use things like social math, you know, if you can say there are, you know, four, uh, 4,500 gun shops in California, you know, well, California's a big state, that seems like a lot of gun shops, but you know, I, I don't know. If you can say there are more gun shops in California than there are McDonald's, that makes sense to people, you know. A well-placed statistic, a well-placed sort of number fact can be really, really useful. Five of them in your messaging, people just get lost. You know, people get stuck on some of those numbers and, you know, you're done with your messaging and they're thinking, is that a big number? Is, is that a lot of dead birds? I don't know. How many birds die in an average day? You know, so you want to make sure that when you're using math, when you're using statistics, that you're using them impactfully and that you're choosing the ones that make the most sense. And any time you can sort of create that social math and compare it to something that people are already have an image in their brain about, you know, if there are more something than there are Starbucks, especially here in D.C., People know what that means. That means there's more than one on every block. You know, so anytime you can use social math or use statistics that really um, resonate, great, but don't, or do avoid the temptation to just throw a ton of numbers in there. And finally, the lack of narrative. Um, especially when we are talking about, you know, in the nonprofit world about environmental issues, we've got great stories. And something that's really important to remember because when you walk out of a room, chances are you're more likely to remember the story, you know, you guys might not remember what the four boxes in this message box um, stood for, but you might say, you know what, there are some people out there who were really stubborn about the frogs and they weren't <laughs> able to, you know, effectively message because they were so hardcore about the frogs. So anytime you can get a narrative, you can get a story um, about real people who are impacted by these decisions, the better off you're going to be and the more effective your messaging will be. Um, so now we are going to break out. We're going to take about a half hour um, to break out, and I have message boxes for everyone. So um, my colleague Mara um, and I will pass these around. Um, and then we'll be walking around, and this is for you to whatever issues that you're working on and you want to create messaging around. Um, we can do that for about the next half hour. We'll be walking around if you have questions. 
Um, if you have just general um, communications questions, we can also answer those. And then we'll come back together, and um, if anybody wants to, they can share with the group. So we'll have about a half hour. So if anyone wants to sneak out, we'll be back up in about a half hour. They want to share with the group, you know, has anybody put together messages that either they're really proud of and want to share with the group or that they're sort of struggling with and would like um, some of your peers' thoughts on? Not going to force anybody, but if anybody would like to. No? Oh. Make everybody to read their message. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to give you the microphone and if you could just tell us the two-second overview of, of your issue um, so that everyone is on the same page. Um, in Loudoun County, where I work, we are trying to get the Board of Supervisors to pass the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance, which is a challenge because people feel like that doesn't have anything to do with them, and it's about our streams, but it's confusing, and the opposition has said it's costly, and burdensome to business and homeowners. So that's the problem. Um, and they've been very effective. And so oh, we are looking at um, talking about the value, which is we all want growth, economic prosperity, um, at the same time that we have a healthy environment. Um, the burden is uh, the message of the opposition, it's costly to homeowners and um, businesses, and they also don't know really the details of this ordinance because it's really complicated and it's been made out to be very complicated. So um, we want to... So how are you getting them over that barrier? So we're giving them information about how uh, it's it's pretty easy to protect buffers and save money and protect the environment. So we can have a healthy economy without spending a lot of money um, if we just protect the buffers that we have. And then, so we're, so we're asking, I guess the ask is asking for the board to pa ask them for the, to call the board and, and pass the <coughs> ordinance. Say to pass the ordinance, sorry. Spelling is atrocious. And then the vision is we can have we can have both economic prosperity and a healthy environment. And who is your audience? Uh, the, not the public, but it is um, <laughs> Thank you. suburban Loudoun residents. So homeowners. 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 Yes. Okay, my sister. <laughs> yes. One question for Jim. Did you change the name of the ordinance now that you're doing a second round? So it's not called the Chesapeake Bay Ordinance anymore, and it's a clean water or dr healthy drinking water or something? I always wondered if that might help. Yes, well, that's been discussed over and over and over and over, but the county has not changed the way they call it, and so we're kind of stuck in the middle. Um, we, will, we call it stream side ordinance, we call it, you know, stream protection ordinance, but uh, I was explaining that we just submitted an ad that is all wrong. We knew it was all wrong when we submitted it, so this has been great going in, not like two hours after we sent the ad in. Yeah. Um, and in there, our best solution was to just not name it, just call it the ordinance to protect our streams. So first, let's give a round of applause for being our brave first victim. So, and then, um, we'd love to get your feedback. What do you guys like about, and please note, I'm very much paraphrasing up here, but what do you like about what she's doing with, with the messaging? You know, what's working? Yep. I'm, I'm curious if you think it's, uh, it's, we just did this in Accomack County to extend the Bay Act protection over to the seaside, had the exact same arguments and found out pretty quickly that the public really wasn't going to change their mind one way or the other. It certainly was never going to get educated. So we sort of skipped the public and went straight to hammering the supervisors, and especially the planning department, yeah. and sort of just beat into them that, you know, that it actually works. It makes you more money if you'll just pass the darn thing. 
and that the real estate folks that are telling them that you know cost them a million dollars are the ones that just cost them a million dollars. So we just had we just trusted the real estate guys to you know build our income and we're all broke because of it. Why are you listening to them again? And that, that kind of worked for us. I don't know if you've tried that already. Do you want me to answer or do you want to stay? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Um, the, we definitely are, are addressing the Board of Supervisors and, and honestly as long as we can keep a majority of the board on that point, we are. The problem is that the um, opposition has dumped thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars into it. And so the community has sort of been riled up about the costs. And um, so yeah, I would like to do what you're talking about, but we can't ignore the public. So and one thing that we talk about sometimes when we're talking about messaging is sort of <laughs> dividing people into the categories of, um, you know, the, the shorthand we use are saints, sinners, and salvageables. You know, the saints are the people who are already on your side, and it's really just important to activate them, to get them to, you know, motivated to do what you want them to do. A lot of times, especially when you have limited resources, we say, Forget about the sinners. You're never going to convince them. You know, like you were saying, you're never going to change their mind. You're never going to get them to believe what you believe. Um, but oftentimes, what makes sense um, in any communications campaign is to focus on those salvageables. You know, figure out how it is that you can connect with that audience. What kind of messaging? What kind of asks you can have that they are willing to do? Uh, because they're sort of the swing voters in the middle. Those are the people who, you know. If you can communicate with them effectively, you might be able to bring to your side. So you can, you know, activate those people who are already on your side, but then get enough of those folks in the middle to sort of get on board. And, you know, they might not be as rah-rah out there as the people who are already on your side, but they might be that, that middle ground that you can move enough to um, actually get the support you need for the change that you need. And I was also going to add, too, um, is you brought up a really good point about audiences. And I think in this, this example, you had the homeowners as the audience, and then the ask is to ask, them, ask the board. If you guys have direct access to the board, mm -hmm. um, I do think that they would make a fine audience in this situation. Oh, yeah. Like, if the homeowners don't really, if you don't think they're, you're going to be able to move them on this issue, then you can go straight to the board to make your ask. Yeah. But again, it's about the decision maker. They're the ones that are going to make the decision about this. And then if you can't reach them directly, that's when you go to the, the audiences around them. But I think that, that's a good point, too. Yep, the shortest line uh, between you and the decision maker, if, you know, if it's not a huge lift, um, is often the most effective way to go. Um, but a lot of times, you know, we don't either have that direct access or Sometimes that decision maker is in that sinner's category and you need to get a lot of pressure on them from the folks in the middle to, to push them to do what you'd like them to do. So do we have any other volunteers that would like to share their messaging? Come on up. Oh, I, I'm loud. I can just do it back here. Okay. That's um, <laughs> this is a little different and again it's coming back about the county supervisors. It is our the values will become self evident and the barrier, it, it, as all of you know. Natural gas mining has tremendous environmental, economic, and other impacts. So a very simple message uh, value was our farms, forests, and rivers are vital to the local economy and our high quality of life. I wrestled a little with peaceful quality of life because gas mining industry is loud, but I thought that sounded too come by off. <laughs> Natural gas mining offers small short-term payments at high costs to property values, Drinking water, health, and safety. Tell your county supervisor that you in Rockingham County just can't afford to industrialize rural lands by approving the natural gas mining permit. Outcome or uh, the vision was our rural economy will continue to support clean, productive farms, forests, and communities. Excellent. Round of applause for Stephen Brayden standing up. <laughs> We wrestled with the whole idea of did I just repeat the barrier? You know, how do you kind of get that message in there that it's either or, an ugly industry or what's there now? So, and she was talking too quickly. I didn't get it all down, but you guys heard heard the messages. What worked for you? 
to do things are those small ones, those things that they're not necessarily going to go out bragging about. You know, they don't want loud trucks going up and down their street every night. Sometimes those are the things that are a lot more likely to actually motivate people to ask or to act. A um, great example of this we've seen is the for years and years and years, um, the anti-smoking efforts have been telling people, telling men in particular, you know, smoking is terrible for your cardiovascular health. Smoking is going to kill you. You're going to have a heart attack. You're going to have high blood pressure. Um, but they, a couple years ago, came out with an ad that was a sort of limp cigarette and said, oh. you know, <laughs> and it was a really effective ad because that's not something that, you know, men are probably out there saying, you know what, I'm, you know, this is something that's really, really important to me. But they found that appealing to men on the basis of their cardiovascular health just wasn't that effective, but that this ad was something that A, was attention grabbing, but B, it was something that people were not, you know, maybe a trade-off people weren't willing to make for smoking. Whereas, you know, hey, I might have a heart attack in 20 years, not as, you know, not as core a value or not, a, not as effective as some folks. So um, it's important to think, you know, as long, as much as we would all like to live in this you know, big, important values that I want to put up there on a billboard, sometimes it is something as simple as, you don't want those trucks going up and down your street. And uh, a lot of times that can motivate people to more action than, hey, you know what, down the line we're going to have all this environmental damage. One more so, question. Yep. As you, you're looking at a single sentence in this campaign, mm -hmm. but could you also... Instead of these great long sentences, what I asked when you showed your TMDL example, yep. can you just have three messages and rotate them in your, you know, to try or, or segment who you're reaching and not the landowners adjacent to least fracking sites. Mm -hmm. um, those who are, so they would have one message about, you know, noise and property values down. Those who are in the drinking water you know, the drinking water spread. Yep. That sort of thing, and the prices might go up. Well, and I think one thing that's important is, because we do sort of start out with these, these four big sentences, but underneath each of those, you can have your supporting points. So they might be, you know, the cost of drinking water will be more expensive, or you will face X, Y, and Z um, impact on your personal property. So these, when we're talking about the message box, we're really talking about your big top line messages, but you will have underneath each of those more supporting points and things to, um, you know, we sort of think of these as I'm introducing my issue to you, but then as we have the conversation, um, you would have those supporting points underneath things like, um, you know, if we're talking about short term gains versus the long term impacts, you, you would have then some supporting points underneath you know, here are some of the long-term impacts. 
So I, I think that that is an important point, and depending on who you're talking to, you might sort of swap in what each of those were. So anybody else like to share their example? Come on up. I'll share mine because it's a very difficult encounter. I'm here to address this the county council. They're doing, um, they're updating their comprehensive plan. They haven't had, this will be a new one after 13 years, and the people who are putting it together are the planning office, and they don't, it's just this exercise that they have to do. So they don't really care about it, but we obviously care about it because it's a policy statement for the next probably decade. And one of the things it lacks is sufficient protections for sensitive areas, including floodplains. It does nothing to, um, to uh, take advantage of uh, current money that's available for forest conservation and uh, doesn't talk about green infrastructure, which is now implemented by the state of Maryland, and they could get some something out of it. So, so my ask was, please include concrete recommendations for protecting the county's sensitive areas. And uh, so their value is our complaint takes advantage of national and state funding opportunities to offset the costs of conservation funding. I feel dirty. Um, the barrier to be <laughs> what we were hoping for this the, afternoon. The barrier to be overcome, um, I think, is mostly lack of knowledge here and and laziness, which. Did you say that was? Oh, the, we were talking about the barrier yeah. the situation, and I mentioned well, maybe laziness in messaging terms means um, lack, just not a priority. Lack of priority. Not a yeah. priority to, the, to these council members. Okay, so my barrier message to them is the county is losing dollars for forest conservation, green infrastructure offsets, and IBAs to other counties in the state of Maryland. <laughs> And then the big vision statement is our comp plan contains multiple options for conservation that don't cost the tech players dollars. Yep. So a round of applause. Mm -hmm. and I just want to add that she actually completed three message boxes during this time. Mm -hmm. And that's a feat for, for anyone to do. So that's very it's impressive. Overachiever. <laughs> no, but I think it's that that's up in two weeks. I'm gonna do it. <laughs> But I think that's a really great example of using their value, not necessarily your value. You know, you're asking them to do it. Um, you're asking them to do something, but you're asking them to do it in a way that makes sense to them. That really taps into, you know, you're not saying, "Hey, do it because the environment needs it. We need these environmental protections." No, you're you're hitting them where where they are. You know, they care about losing out on that money. So I think that's a really great example of sort of taking something that you, you know, taking something from an environmental standpoint, but really tapping into a value that, you know, might not be your value, might not be the reason you want to do it. You know, we're not doing it for the frogs, we're doing it for the traffic, but at the end of the day, you know, you're going to get the same result and they're going to think that they won, but really at the end of the day, you won. You're probably not just tapping into their potential loss of, of extra funding, but they're, if, if they're a wannabe county, they, they're, you're probably tapping into their um, other counties are doing something that we're not, that we could be doing. Yeah, you know, it's a weird double-edged sword, though, now, because on some things, like my other one, the barrier is we're not going to do anything that the state tells. We're not like any other mm -hmm. county in the state, because that's mm -hmm. what they claim, too. So it depends. You're absolutely right. It depends mm -hmm. on yeah. what you're actually talking about. Can I just ask a, a question to pick Sorry. up on that last point about finding an audience that that might have a value that's not not exactly it's a roundabout sort of surrogate value. Yep. Um, and a question for Shenandoah back there. Um, fishing. People people in that area I think like to fish in the local waterways and and they really that, like the fishing as an economic sector. Right. So both recreation and economic value of, of fishing in the local streams. Did that did that come up as a just part of the quality? I guess that's part of the quality. Well, I will tell you when the campaign launched and we had one week from finding out about the permit to the first public hearing, mm -hmm. the water, drinking water, quantity of water, and recreation of water, including fishing, were the lead drivers asking the board for caution. Don't 
rush into this industry. And the messages then got more complicated after, you know, more sophisticated as we learned more. It was a big driver. Now, I would say we win our zoning fights because the other side plays so stupidly. This first well in Virginia is in the floodplain, the 100 year floodplain of the North Fork of the Shenandoah, which alone accounts for 22,000 residents drinking water and feeds to the Shenandoah and the Potomac and 5 million people in the DC area. So, not that the pollutants would make it that far, but still. Um, lucky for us. Yeah, so, but fishing's been really important because you can't eat anything. Yeah, and, and that's a really good um, point that, you know, focusing on some, some of those little values, some of those things that, you know, while they might not be a huge value in terms of, you know, one of my top three values, for people who really value their fishing, you know, what I really love to do on, on a Sunday morning is get up and be able to go out and fish, that might be a bigger motivator for them than one of those you know, big values. I believe in the value of clean water. I think it's important. You know, but if you're going to impact my lifestyle, you know, you're going to impact my recreation time. Something that I'm, I'm going to stand up and fight you on. Um, so it's a really good point. Um, anybody else like to share? Come on up. I work at the National Wildlife Federation, and my boss has been working for about 10 years on the Clean Water Act jurisdiction issue. There were a couple of Supreme Court decisions, one in 2001 and one in 2006, that um, dramatically reduced which waters are protected by the Clean Water Act. So um, she's been working on it for about 10 years, and our strategy has always been to try to get Congress to pass legislation, but it's become increasingly more partisan, and no legislation has ever actually been voted on by the Senate, um, just and one vote by the House. So now we're gathering together a group of um, hunters and anglers along with some other conservation organizations in February to ask them for feedback about our campaign strategies, but also to make a push um, to uh, ask them to ask the EPA uh, to initiate a rulemaking, which would broaden the definition of the waters of the United States. It wouldn't be as comprehensive as legislation, um, so the protections wouldn't be as good, but um, it's kind of our only hope at this point. So. There are two concerns. One, people are a little tired. It's been 10 years. And two, we're giving up on the, rule, uh, on the legislation. Um, so my value, or the value that we would um, promote, is uh, to protect our recreation heritage, we need clean water. And then the main barrier that I see is people being tired and also questioning why we're reaching to EPA. Um, so I said, uh, now is the time, and the administration's our best hope. Um, and then also we've got some questions like, why is EPA going to act this time so we can point to other rulemakings that it, they've initiated along the lines of the Clean Air Act. Um, and then our ask would be to ask them to submit comments to EPA asking them to undertake a rulemaking that clarifies and restores the definition of the waters of the U.S. Um, but Jane pointed out that that might not be something that they would know how to do, so coming out of the summit, we might just ask them to sign up for a listserv and then direct them to a website. And then I guess our echo vision would be that um, your heritage would be protected because small streams of weapons receive clean water after on the class. So, and one thing that I really um, like about this example is that the audience that she's talking to is not necessarily the first audience that you think of, you know, when you're trying to get clean water um, protections extended. You know, they're not talking about, hey, I want to go to these uh, left-wing environmental groups. I want to go to these groups that, you know, I know really care about the fish or the birds or the water. Um, but by talking about the hunters and anglers, it's a really smart audience uh, because it's people who use these waters, who um, you know, who feel very tied to this land and this water. So I think that's a really smart strategy that they're going after. Um, anybody have feedback or comments on? You want to share your? Okay, one sec. Does anybody? Any other feedback? Some come on up. Good afternoon, everybody. There you go. I'm Vaughn Perry, and I'm with Groundwork Anacostia. And primarily, our goal is to um, connect people back towards the outdoors, be it parks or rivers or whatnot. Um, and so, my audience would primarily be the local residents of the Anacostia River water uh, watershed region. And so, one of the barriers is 
how does clean water or what does clean water have to do with uh, with them? Um, one thing that we found is through research, um, one thing that people care about is their families. And so our value is the family. And so our, t our, our top value would be clean water helps to protect families. Um, overcoming the barrier, clean water cuts down on the c contaminants or toxins in local produce and fish and drinking water. Uh, the ask is please come out and volunteer in your next local community effort to clean up your river. And then the, uh, the, vision, the overall vision is just families, your family will be healthier for generations to come. Excellent. So, and I think that's another great example of taking a value that people really hold dear. You know, they, while they might not necessarily think, hey, this is an issue I'm really invested in, by tying it to their individual family, you know, and, and this is something that impacts your family every day, it gets them over that apathy that, you know, there's a lot of things I care about. Maybe I don't want to come out and volunteer for this. Um, any feedback? Yep. Just one question for Ron. Is the volunteer day, can kids of a certain age participate? So could the whole family volunteer? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then that's my only tweak is maybe the final mm -hmm. revision is this is a fun activity for mm -hmm. family today and it will guarantee their health in the future. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Continuing I, I to bring the family all the ask, way ask is perfect. Mm -hmm. A day outside, you know, doing something. Can you just repeat your uh, the value message one more time? Uh, clean water help protect families. Great. So I think at the beginning you mentioned that um, that they don't really know what the connection is between their family and clean water. So if this is the message where they're really going to nod their head in agreement, you might not even need to include clean water anywhere in your value message. Mm -hmm. You might just say, you know, we want our families to stay healthy, so that you know. Stay healthy. I mean, mm -hmm. healthy families is a great value. And then when you get into the barrier, then you can connect. You can make that connection. Well, actually, in order to stay healthy, we need the, the clean water. So it's just um, a matter of, of thinking about what they understand at the very beginning. But I, I really liked it. It was very clean and simple. And it's good. Thanks. All right. Anybody else want to share with the group? Pennsylvania. Last chance. I'm not. <laughs> you heard from Judge Junior. I actually come at this from a faith community perspective. I work for the Pennsylvania Council of Churches. So uh, the audience would be people in congregations um, with a, a, a focus on those who are uh, sort of you know, clergy and opinion leaders congregations. Um, value is that we want clean, safe water to protect the health and welfare of all of God's children as, as people created in the image of God. The barrier for most is the cost is, cost is too high and it will cause job loss and hurt the economy. Now that's not much of a faith uh, message, but the, the fact is that the faith messages don't always work in the faith community. Um, as I've come to find over the number of years. You mentioned about feeling dirty. I feel dirty a lot of the time. Um, anyway, the, um, the value is that we want uh, healthy and growing congregations and that we need a healthy community for those congregations to grow and thrive. Um, the, uh, the barrier is um, And I, I, I really need to tweak this a lot more, but um, people who talk about the cost being too high, but the fact is that where the churches are dying right now are in the communities where the environment is not healthy. People are leaving, the jobs are leaving, the congregations are, are falling apart. They're, they're getting to a point where the level of membership is critical and they feel overwhelmed because they can't deal with the needs in the community as they used to. Uh, the uh, ask is that um, folks ask their elected officials and policymakers to uh, pass legislation that 
protects our water and that they enforce uh, rules to keep it clean uh, in order to enhance communities and jobs. And then going back to the echo vision, if we have appropriate legislation and rules that are enforced, then our communities will uh, have healthy environments and congregations can continue to grow and thrive. So, and I think something unique that you did in your barrier message is um, beyond talking about the economic cost, you really made that connection for people um, so that if folks said, you know, I don't get what clean water has to do with uh, my congregation dying, you know, you um, sort of implicitly made that connection that in communities um, where, or in some of the church communities that were, were shrinking it was also places that they didn't have access to clean water or that clean water was threatened. So I think that that was a good, um, a good way of really answering sort of, you know, we always say one barrier, but sometimes when lack of knowledge is a barrier, you can sort of squeeze it in there with another one. So I think you did a really good job of making explicit how these issues were connected. So does anybody have comment feedback they'd like to share? Excellent. Well, wonderful. If nobody else wants to share, I don't want to cut anybody off, but I also don't want to make anybody come up here who doesn't want to. Um, so thank you guys so much for the opportunity to talk to you today. I um, wanted to give you guys one, one last chance. You know, Are there any questions as you went through the exercise? Is there anything that came up that you sort of um, have questions about, things that weren't quite clear? Um, you can use the vision statement in a couple of different ways. Sometimes when you are talking to an audience, sometimes you want to start with that vision. You want to show them where you're going and then go through the other messages to tell them how you get to that vision. Um, but sometimes you can use it um, almost in closing. You know, you've gone through, you've addressed their value, you have gotten them over the barrier, you know, you've made your ask. And sometimes that vision statement can also make sort of a nice closing statement that, you know, if you do the thing that I ask you to do, this is where we're going to end up. Um, and it sort of leaves folks on a nice point that, that they've come along with you now and they understand why their role is important to the goal that you're trying to achieve. Any other questions? You said something about conducting earlier in the discussion about conducting stakeholder interviews mm -hmm. to, I guess, find out how to address the TMDLs. Is that what you were doing? Before? Yep, we, we were gathering information from a variety of stakeholders to learn both how people were um, talking about TMDLs, what, what they found was resonating, but then also to find out sort of where they were coming from on the TMDL issue so that we could um, really tap into some of those values and to, to figure out what those barriers were. I guess my question is, and this is sort of, is one of the things that we're struggling with the idea of is doing stakeholder interviews um, sort of across, across county, both business, government leadership, you know, neighborhood groups, mm -hmm. just to talk about the value of of uh, natural resource conservation in I mean, mm -hmm. specifics. And I wonder if, you know, obviously not all those audiences are going to be audiences that are, are uh, sympathetic audiences. Mm -hmm. um, and I sort of come down on the side of, I think it's worth knowing what they have to say about these things because yep. you have to start talking somewhere. Um, but others think Well, and they can also sometimes you'll find strange spots of common ground that then you can um, use and that you can work to, you know, hey, we both are actually interested in this part of this issue, so maybe we won't agree on the full issue, but maybe we can work together on these aspects of things. Yeah. Yeah, part of it is I just like to have a less adversarial sort of way forward. Mm -hmm. And I think 
Yeah, well, and one of the interesting things, um, and we do a lot of stakeholder interviews um, on a variety of topics. Almost every time we come into a new project or a new issue area, we like to, if possible, do some stakeholder interviews and to get a broad sense of where people are on the issue, where some of the other, you know, maybe organizations who are either working against you or working in tangent, but maybe coming at it from a different direction, you know, where they are, where they're starting on this issue. And we found it really, can be really effective. But the other thing I think we find is that a lot of times people are more willing to talk to you than you think. Um, even if they disagree with you on an issue, they're happy to tell you why you're wrong, you know, or to tell you why you're coming at it. Um, but those can be some of the, the most um, enlightening conversations because you get some of those insights that if you're only talking to people who are sort of on your side of an issue, you're not necessarily going to get. Um, so I would definitely encourage you as you're doing audience research to think about talking to some of those opposition voices. Um, and I think you'll be surprised, A, at how willing they are to talk, but also sometimes at the things that you walk away with. Um, some of the things that we heard doing some of the TMDL research um, were things that, you know, frankly, we just hadn't thought of or, or angles that we might not have known had we not talked to people who were you know, not entirely in lockstep with um, Choose Clean Water's positions on the issue. Yep. Do you recommend doing those interviews um, face to face? Is it a dialogue? Are they sort of open ended? Do you do some of it electronically and some of it? We've done them a variety of different ways. Um, for the most part, we do a lot of telephone interviews. Um, call <coughs> people up, you know, or email them in advance and say, Can I have 20 minutes, a half hour of your time? And then talk to them over the phone. Um, in person is great and I think can be sort of the most effective when you can do it. Um, it's just logistically not always possible. Um, but even sometimes with people who you don't know as well or you don't have direct connections to, you know, sometimes having a couple open-ended questions that you email them and ask them to, you know, hey, can you tell me what you think about this? Um, you know, can be a great way to get that feedback and to get some of that information. So I think you know, it's sort of if at the top is sitting down face to face with them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, you know what, don't do it electronically, don't do an email. I think if that's your option, I think that's a great way to do it. And that's also a good place for online surveys. Um, yeah. I mean, especially if, if you as the group, you want to do the interviews, it might be kind of awkward if you're, you know, an environmental group calling up the county council and they're going to, you know, be a little weird about that. So like SurveyMonkey is free, and one thing that we found is really successful is to offer them an incentive. Um, obviously their time is really valuable, so we've like thrown in gift cards or some sort of like you know, raffle for an iPod, or just something that will um, give them the incentive to take the time to fill it out. Exactly, to take the five or ten minutes. Um, and sometimes um, things like the SurveyMonkey or, uh, or email communication, especially on contentious issues, can actually be helpful because people might um, might be a little more open. You know, they'd feel kind of awkward saying to your face, "Hey, I think what your group is doing is wrong," or "I think you're ridiculous," or "I think you're coming at this wrong." But especially if you give them that level of anonymity, um, a lot of times people are willing to give you really frank opinions, um, and people love to be asked what they think about things. I mean, I think that's the thing that has been the most surprising to us as we do these stakeholder interviews. Is you think that you know. People talk about this issue all day long. They're not going to want to sit down and spend 20 minutes with me, but people love to tell you what they think, and especially when they can do it in sort of an unofficial capacity um, on background. They're more willing than we expect them to be. Yep. Um, Jamie, just one last question before we wrap up. I remember some email traffic from you all three months into working with Choose Clean Water where you were really clear, do not ever use TMDL again. It's the pollution that is. Before you go, Personally, or for Spitfire, what are the other verboten words that we don't seem to get and we continue to use um, so that we can just keep them in our head and what are the alternatives to them? That's a really good question. Is my eyes blaze ever with all that up in my memory. Yeah, exactly. Charismatic megafauna, never. Non point um, source. Yeah, non point source is a really What's the alternative tough to one. Um, Question. I mean, unregulated pollution, I think, is something that, you know, makes more sense to people. 
Um, runoff or voting are okay. Runoff, people don't necessarily know what that means. I mean, I think if you can break it down for yeah. folks, okay. um, you know, and I think that's the challenge, and especially, you know, when we're sitting in a room like this, you know, you say runoff, everybody here knows what it means, we know what you're trying to get across, but if you say runoff, you know, to a guy on the metro, that doesn't mean anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the test that we like to use a lot is sort of the, you know, sitting down at mom's kitchen table. You know, if I go home and I'm telling my mom about a new account I'm working on, and if she's going to look at me like I've grown a second head or she's not going to be able to sort of grasp it, um, chances are you want to look for another word. Um, and one thing that, that we came down to um, on the TMDL, I mean, obviously TMDL is a very specific technical uh, conversation, and, you know, water safety standards isn't as technical, isn't as specific, but water safety standards resonates with people. So in cases like that, you know, when you're talking to a legislator, when you're talking to a scientist, you know, we're not saying never use these words again. But when you're trying to bring people onto your side, you know, try to use language that's going to make sense to them. So any other questions? Excellent. Well, if there is one thing that you guys walk out of here today uh, with, it's, at least if I had my way, I would really want you to remember to think about your audiences and to try to re rem remember to focus on their values, not your values, um, and not being dishonest, you're not being, you know, backhanded, but by focusing on what they care about, you're going to be a lot more effective in your communications with them, and quite frankly, a lot more likely to get what you want, uh, because they're not necessarily doing it, you know, for the frogs, or for the fish, or for the uh, uh, water, but they're doing it for the reasons that, you know, matter to them, and um, especially uh, today, you know, with clean water, those economic messages are often the most effective. So don't shy away from sort of talking about the economics of clean water. It's something that is uh, right now going to be really effective, especially as the legislatures you know, have changed. So I definitely encourage you not to forget about the value um, of talking about the money when we're talking about clean water. So thank you guys so much for your time, and uh, Mara and I will be around for a couple minutes afterwards if you have questions or anything um, that you want to ask afterwards. And we have a bunch of extra uh, message boxes um, that you are more than welcome to take home. So thanks.